from the break, we have a fantastic panel for you today, um, or it's actually more like sort of ven venture capitalist speed dating. Yes, yes, yes. So it's the investors shaping the future of industries, and I'm joined first of all by Aileen Lee from Cowboy Ventures. Um, she's a uh, Cowboy Ventures is a fund that backs seed stage technology startups um, who reimagine work and personal lives, which they call Life 2.0. Are you living your 2.0 life? <laughs> <laughs> um, and Aileen was also a partner with Kleiner Perkins for over a decade. So you have this fantastic long history of investing. And what I was really curious about to start off with in this panel is what is different about being an investor in an AI company and yeah. like choosing AI companies to the rest of the investments you do? Yeah. Um, so we are, obviously you all know that because you're here, thanks for coming. Uh, we're in the dawn of, I think, a new era of software where AI and computer vision and machine learning will drive, I think, especially in enterprises, uh, kind of the upgrade cycle, right? When you're, when you're an enterprise, if you've been using a certain point of sale or a certain system of record or certain types of vertical applications, uh, you, you standardize your whole company on that. It's a big deal to basically rip it out or, uh, rip and replace it, and so there has to be a reason why. Uh, and at Cowboy, we're very optimistic. The reason why is you could call it AI-driven or smarter software. Or some uh, tech, we work with a company called Textio that calls it learning loop software, where there's a loop that makes the software. So it's not rules-based. It actually is learning and improving based on the data that, that it learns from or the user behavior. Um, and so, but as also the big platforms have a lot of AI modules, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of open source algorithms, there's a lot of software out there. Uh, and so I think the, the difference with a lot of AI driven companies is, you know, where is the data set coming from that you're training off of? And is it going to be proprietary in any way? And how do you basically build a data moat around your product and your company? Because if the data is easily accessible by anyone, there will be many competitors basically using open source algorithms or um, open source code. And a lot of competition, I think we've seen this quite a bit in the chatbot space, where it's just like no, there is no big, massive chatbot data set. And so people are kind of training off the same thing. And you're going to wind up having a bunch of products that are fairly similar. And then it wind, can wind up being just then a kind of a race to the bottom in terms of pricing, unless you're able to build something really unique. And that's fascinating. So take the example of Textio. Mm -hmm. what, what is its training data that no one else has? So I think they were, you know, when, I, when we met the Textio founders, uh, they had this idea that writing was an untapped data source. And that any writing that had an attached outcome, so if you were on a, you know, the J. Crew website and you looked at a different shirt uh, descriptions and you clicked on certain ones, the click and, what, and the purchase was the, was the loop. Um, and so if you looked at what was written on the page, how many pictures, what were the words, what were the tone of the words, if you had enough of it and you had enough clicks, you could see if there were some correlations and some patterns, but how you should describe a shirt to optimize the outcome of someone clicking to purchase it. Um, and so they had, they had this theory about writing, and they basically uh, wrote an engine that scraped Kickstarter. Uh, mm -hmm. And they wondered if they could predict whether a Kickstarter campaign was going to be funded and at what velocity and at, at, at the target goal just by what was on how the campaign was written. Like how many pay, like what words were used, how long was it, what was the spacing, were there bullet points, were there pictures. Uh, and they were able to basically write something that was 95% predictive of whether a campaign was get, get funded because of the underlying dating of the, of the words and the pictures and the tone and the spacing and the length and all that stuff. And so then they thought, like, what else can we do? So when we invested at Seed, um, which is the difference also from you know, being at a cowboy versus a Kleiner, is like when we invested, they were like, we've done this thing and we can use it for a bunch of things. We'd like some money to figure out which are the things. <laughs> um, and so you know, ideally before you, you figure that out during your seed period, and then when you go into your A, you've figured out the application, you've got people using it. We decided that um, words that had to do with people like job descriptions or performance reviews or things that were kind of HR related was gonna be the first application after we looked at a bunch of different applications. Um, and they basically did deals with uh, very large hirers like an Intel or a Cisco where they're just writing tons of job specs uh, and they get lots of job applications and they have applicant tra tracking systems so you can track all the applicants and you can see who got an interview and who got a job and how long it took to fill and what were the, de what were the demographics of the jobs that were of the people who applied to f and also through uh, partnerships with people like Monster or Indeed or Hired where you could just basically create this massive but put together where you go out and get the data and then you put together your own data set. Um, and you can build software that basically trains off of lots of different locations and types of jobs. 
Uh, and so that's how, they, how we've done it at Textio. See, I find that fascinating because you like to think that you're applying for a job because you know you know the brand name of the company mm -hmm. or the role or the salary or whatever, but you're basically saying that it's really key the language that's used. Absolutely. So, you know, there are. Uh, I think Textio is really the team is really great about kind of writing up some of their findings in blogs. So, if you're interested in this, or if you're an employer and you're interested in how do you close your jobs faster, we, on average, we we close jobs 15% faster when people basically write their specs in Textio than without, because we know what words are people, and also with more diversity, more diverse candidates of, of more veterans or more people of color or more women will apply to a job that's well-written, because job specs, as you know, are generally very subjective and sometimes well-written, sometimes poorly written by a hiring manager or, or a recruiter, uh, and it makes a big difference. And another one of your companies is also a sort of a, um, is an accountant, the yeah. uh, Victoria, the AI accountant. Nick AI, yeah. And, and um, I, I clearly wrote this before I did my taxes because I said, uh, <laughs> what can sh uh, she do that I can't? Yes. Uh, and, my, and that my accountant can't. And after having done my taxes, I think yes. probably quite a lot. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of, what's exciting about AI-driven software is there are a lot of things that are repetitive in how we enter information into systems. And you, like, you know, it, same thing as, for example, if you open a browser every day and you open the same tabs and you do the same things, like, why do you have to do the same thing every single day? Right? I believe that software over the next five years will know the things that you do personally or may be able to capture the wisdom of the crowds of what other people at your company or in your department or that all use this product do most often, and they will either kind of make recommendations or do things for you. Uh, so at Vic.ai, we got really lucky. Uh, we met these two gentlemen that have been quite successful serial entrepreneurs in Norway, and they kind of wanted to come here and start for the first time a company in the U.S., but they've got great relationships in Norway. And in Norway, um, the accounting rules are different than here, where all companies have to do quarterly uh, accounting, and they have to have audited financials every quarter. Wow. So the data, kind of the amount of data that they have of like basically all types of companies' financial information and is, sits in accounting firms, and if you can basically do a deal with accounting firms to be able to get those data sets, you have fantastic training data. Um, but you, if anyone who has done their taxes or done sales tax for a company or, you know, or basically read a, a, like an account payable or account receivable and, like, and then had to enter it into a system of record or a different, like it's an eyeball and say like, oh, this is the account number, this is the, um, this is the payee or the payor, this is the invoice number, and this must be related to travel. Right? These are like not rocket science things to do, but bookkeepers all the time sit there, eyeball things, and then type them from one system into another, or read a piece of paper and type into a system. Like That's not a great use of a human. Um, so that's something a computer should be able to do, and the humans can basically troubleshoot the, the things where the computer's not totally sure, um, but that's what, we're, that's what we do at Vic. And presumably the human error rate there is actually probably higher. Than yes, exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. So it's fascinating that you um, you got this investment in Norway. Um, are you looking around the world right. for AI talent? We're not. <laughs> so um, venture is, I think, a pretty local business. Yeah. Where you really want to be able to help with recruiting. You want to be able to go sit down. You know, if the CEO or the founder or the VP of engineering or product calls and says, "Can I bounce this off of you?" You want to be able to go over and be like, "Hey, you want me to come over today?" Um, and so. Uh, I do think it's really hard for uh, venture investors to invest in, in, especially in early stage, where there's a lot of recruiting, marketing, product, uh, finance, prioritization exercises where having trusted insiders to you can bounce things off of are really helpful. Like once you get to Series B or Series C, you pretty much know what you're doing, right? You've you figure you've got critical mass in your team and with with your um, with your customers that I think the investment can be from a further away place. Um, but fortunately for us, the Norwegians decided to move here. Well, I'm sure they didn't mind that. Um, and um, you also have a huge range of investment outside AI, mm -hmm. but we're obviously constantly hearing that AI is disrupting every business. Mm -hmm. How do you advise them? I mean, some of them are, you know, you have a lot of e-commerce companies, you have Phil's Coffee. Like, mm -hmm. How do you tell them how to get their head around AI? Um, I don't think ever, it's for everyone uh, at an every stage. So it really depends on you know where you are in your business and also what's what, what like what's ahead. What does the competitive landscape look like? 
um, and where are the opportunities? So, and and you know, do you ha what's the core competency of your company, right? If your core, if your company is not a, like a technology-oriented company, um, it may not be the right choice. But I also think that AI-driven software, if you're a, a, a purchaser of software, right, before you make decide to make an investment in any system, I think it's really important to understand what's the roadmap for the company and what's the DNA of the company because you could be buying something that's basically based on old user experience and kind of like how we've seen in the enterprise where um, it's been, like, you've probably heard this phrase, the consumerization of the enterprise. And it's, I think a lot of it comes because of iPhone, right? Because consumer products like Dropbox and iPhone that had really great UXs that worked on different devices in different locations that were cloud-based, then you went to your office and you're like, why am I using this shitty software that doesn't work any place else? And it, it, it puts pressure on internal uh, departments and decision makers to basically want to upgrade the software so that it can match the, the great, easy experience that, you, that consumers now have. Um, and so I think consumers, there will be, just like you know, with Uber and Lyft and companies like that, it's such a magical, easy, just a couple clicks to basically have a service delivered you, to you, then you know, when you're in your office and you're ordering staples or paper and you have to do it the old way where you have to fill out forms and, you have, and then it has to be like, it takes three days or it takes five days, it, like it doesn't make sense. The minute someone comes up to you and says like, I can make this like, Lyft or, or Uber for you, you're, you know, a light bulb is going to go on your head. Just like that's what I that's what I want my business experiences to be like. I want them to be respectful of my time, and to be transparent and delightful and easy and portable. Um, so I think anybody who's thinking about purchasing software um, or building software, that's the mindset that I think people need to build for for to be to make sure that you're delighting customers in the future. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I should have said at the start that we will be taking questions at the end of each of the four speakers we've got today. So if you want to send in your questions, um, I will apparently get them on this iPad. Oh, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> um, but, but first of all, I mean, you may be fed up with people bringing up the fact that you coined the word unicorn. <laughs> Um, but you did, and it, it's, uh, it's served an important purpose in the rally for a while now. I mean, do you think that many there'll be many of these AI companies getting to that size, or is the demand for the talent and the technology just mean that the big tech companies are going to buy them up way beforehand? Right. So I, um, I think AI and, and ML and NLP are basically going to be core components of a lot of the software of the future. Um, so they may or may not be called AI companies, but it's kind of like cloud-based companies, right? It's like, or companies that work on your phone, mm -hmm. right? It's not, like, that's not really what it is. It's kind of the table stakes, I think, for how we build software in the future. Um, so yes, I think there will be many multi-billion dollar companies that the reason, like, basically, someone's using an old system of record for finance or for HR or for sales, or, and it's not smart, and it doesn't learn from all the account data that it's sitting on, from your calendar, from the email traffic that's going on within your team or across teams. It doesn't take into account external news, news feeds that like an important change has happened with this account. Like it's not smart software. And so if someone comes up to the sales team and says, I've got this smart software that basically will sa save your rep's time, will save your manager's time, because it basically does all this analysis and calculation for you, would you like to look at it? Like the answer is gonna be yes. And so that, that's the window for the next Salesforce or the next Workday or any of the next big enterprise companies, I think, or, and potentially consumer companies as well um, because they're, it's, it's going to surprise and delight the customer, whether it's a consumer or an enterprise. Do you think that uh, the consumer companies are slightly different because they mm -hmm. already are in everyone's hands and they have that sort of fantastic distribution mechanism? I think, I mean, for... There's a, you know, Zorro went public recently, right? So there's a lot of talk in consumer about how consumers are getting more and more used to subscriptions um, and that consumers want more personalization. Uh, and so I think in the consumer experience, like, I don't think that, like, your shoes are going to be built by some, like, magical AI shoe, shoe guessing bot. <laughs> but, These are the, you know, <laughs> the top notch Silicon Valley shoes. Um, but I do think that in like, recommendation engines or personalization, or there, there'll be a bunch of things, and maybe in large categories like travel, um, or in real estate, or in personal finance, I certainly think there's a, where there's a lot of data. Um, and in shopping as well, or like in grocery shopping, right? There's, there's a lot of data that's not currently tapped by services. There, everything is like 
command driven. Like, I want orange juice. Okay, orange juice. And you get orange juice. Like, I just think that like, that's the paradigm of how user input and the underlying data is harnessed to deliver services is going to change. Our, our uh, audience seems to be a little bit shy. Oh, no, here we are. Just oh, as do you I guys know that. where to send the questions? Where do you, what, how do you? Well, no one told me either. So <laughs> where do the questions I, come from? So there's some, I think there must be an app related to the conference. Anyone? Does anyone know what it is? <laughs> well, I don't know which it is, but it's somewhere. But there is a mic also. There so is a if mic. you just raise your hand, yeah. um, we can pass the mic around. There's one here, and then if anyone wants to get ready with one with a mic question, that would be great too. So um, Ansel Halliburton asks, are there any specific industry verticals you're excited about for AI enterprise startups? I think. Um, I mean, that's the beauty of my job, is in a way, like, I don't really have to think of the specific ideas, because <laughs> entrepreneurs think of the ideas. Like, that, you know, for example, with Textio or with Vic, like, I mean, I would say finance was definitely a category that we think is ripe, because there's just so much data, and there's so much manual labor involved in doing your taxes. Like, we, we, we're uh, also investors in a company that does, uh, will basically do rules and AI for sales tax, because there's, Small business owners, medium-sized business owners, and corporations spend so much time figuring out county-based, state-based, by-month, by-quarter, and annual sales tax, and that you shouldn't have to look up rule books and do manual calculations when you're figuring out your sales tax. Like That should be magically calculated for a business owner. Um, so I do think that there's a lot. I mean, like I mentioned, in most of the system of records or like kind of legacy enterprise applications where there is, it's possible to basically learn and train off of historical data or to amass a data set of, from multiple companies or multiple uh, customers. We're, we actually are also investors in a company called Vorstella in the DevOps space because when you're bringing up um, da new data-driven applications, DevOps has become a bottleneck in kind of the fragmentation of the many services and the many applications and people's infrastructures. It used to be 10 years ago, people were really good at like managing Oracle, let's say. Um, and now there's so many different databases and like nobody in DevOps is expert at tuning and managing the performance of any specific one. And so if there was a software company that basically was able to manage and monitor different customers' instances and understand and learn from the performance of when you change different knobs and dials, how does the performance change, and then feed that back into the system and make the whole system smarter for everyone. Um, I think that's a fantastic application of AI. Um, and so it's really, I think, um, you know, one exercise that we, try and, uh, that we try and go through sometimes is like, what are things that suck? <laughs> um, you know, there are just experiences in your personal life and your work life that are inefficient, where the user experience is really bad, where it's really latent where you have to do the same thing over and over again, or you just really don't like how, how it works. Like, that's an opportunity for someone to build a new software company. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I think, well, I need one, more, one question from the floor. Yeah, oh. we have two over there, oh, okay. one over there. Hi, uh, my name is Cynthia, I'm CEO of Cafe X, which is a robotic coffee bar. Might be compared to Phil's. Uh, but I'm actually curious uh, about your thoughts uh, around the intersection of AI and hardware. So you're, you're talking mostly about software here. Do you shy away from hardware because right. of the capital requirements? Or is this something you are actually actively exploring? Um, well, as a seed investor in a seed fund, it is harder for smaller funds to invest in very capital intensive businesses. Um, because we just wind up getting really diluted when you have to raise a lot more money. So I think the question is, we don't shy away. Like we are investors in a company called August, which is a smart lock company. Um, the question is, like, how much can you get done on the seed round? And can you get enough done with a two or three million dollar round? Uh, and then, you know, how, and will you be able to get enough done that the A will not be crazy dilutive for all of us? Um, is really, the, I think, more of the restriction for us. I, I, I really do believe it's, um, it's funny. I, uh, we saw recently, uh, and this is maybe a benefit of being a female investor because we're unfortunately in the minority, but so like anything that's like a robotic facialist or like a robotic eyelash, like what do you call the gluing the eyelashes, eyelash extension, like we see a lot of those, which is really great because I'm sure a lot of male VCs are like, what, eyelash extensions, like mm -hmm. hair extensions, is that a thing? Um, <laughs> but like there's a lot of things that robots should be good at. There's one in, I think in Palo Alto, Menlo Park that's basically doing a robotic hair transplants. Oh. Um, I think it's really. I think male VCs should be into that. Uh, yeah, actually probably, yeah, probably <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, like, I mean, it, it, 
the, the, the future of work and the implications for society, I think, are also really important for our industry to consider. Because like, if the lady who does eyelash extensions and the guy who, like, if she's at risk of losing her job, like, there's, that means a lot of people are potentially at risk of losing their job. But, um, but so it all just comes down to uh, you know, just the market size, the capital requirements. And if you need $15 million to get the arm to work to be able to recognize someone's eye, that's probably not going to be a great fit for someone like us. And it would be better for a bigger fund. Well, we did, in the end, get more questions, but unfortunately, our time is up. So thank you <laughs> Thank you so much, much for coming. Hope you have a great afternoon. <laughs> and these ladies are amazing, smart investors. So Rebecca Lynn is the uh, co-founder and general partner at Canvas. Um, she focuses on early stage investments in fintech, digital health, AI, and machine learning, which is still quite a lot. It's a pretty broad. Yeah. Oh, well, there, um, there's my voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, thanks so much for joining me. In fact, I, what I wanted to pick up on was something we, we just um, kind of ended on with Aileen there, which sure. was the um, the potential for job losses, right? You know, we hear a lot AI about is it. very exciting, but as she said, if, if every person who does eyelash extensions um, it, and potentially every accountant um, and lawyer and journalist um, can be You're fine. Don't by worry. <laughs> <laughs> this bit is probably harder yeah. for the robot, but the, the writing bit, there's a lot of narrative. Is it Narratives, the company that does um, sort of earnings reports and sports reports? Oh, there's, all, there's a lot of examples. But I mean, when, the, when cars came out, the buggy whip manufacturers went out of business, right? Yeah. So people do reinvent themselves. But the thing I think is more exciting about AI are the amount of jobs that are enabled. And there are a couple of examples. So Vita Health is one of my companies I'm super proud of, also a woman CEO, which was exciting. And um, they have sold like, multi-million dollar deals in huge corporations. And what they're doing is providing a coaching platform. And they have, the, what we found over time in behavioral health especially is you actually need to interact with a person. And that there's something to that that really does impact what your results are. But they use AI underneath to enable that coach. So they have a bunch of people, literally physical people, not bots, that um, do the majority of the work. There's some things that can be answered by AI, but what they do is they use the AI to make those people much more efficient in their job so that they can actually afford to implement a live program, which is kind of, iron kind of ironic in a way, yeah. right? That AI is enabling people to actually have this job and enable people to be touched by live people. And so that's a great example of, of AI actually helping people have a job and helping make people's lives better. And another one is Crowdflower, which is now figure eight. They just rebranded. And they, um, they, they're sort of a, you know, empower AI to actually work and help people actually leverage AI in their business applications. But there are people behind the scenes often that help add data, clean data, do things like that. And those people are located all over the world. And if you walk in the Crowdflower building, you'll see testimonials and pictures of these people everywhere. And they're very grateful for that work. So I think it does cut both ways, but what AI does better for everyone is it helps to save them time and I hope make their job a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say the better because um, one of your uh, companies is um, an AI-based research assistant for lawyers. Yes. And I couldn't help but think of um, when my, uh, you know, I was straight out of college and all my friends started getting these junior lawyer jobs and I oh, was like, oh, it sounds so impressive and important. And they were like, <laughs> I literally just press control F all day. Oh my goodness, <laughs> yes. Um, and so I was wondering, like, Obviously, that would make their jobs more interesting. How do you think you would end up having to rethink whole paths of careers, though? Because that used to be the best training they could get. Well, that's also it's, uh, there's already been uh, pressure completely outside. So I was a lawyer, actually. Well, I wasn't ever technically a lawyer. I did the bar. Let's just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> but after work, I was. But after working for about nine years, I went back on sabbatical, sabbatical to go get my law degree, thinking that might be a fun thing to do while I had kids. And uh, so I, I went to law school. I went you know, to work for a summer, so I've had that experience, and I invested in case techs because I'm like, my God, if I was doing litigation, which is what I did, I would absolutely want to have this because it makes you smarter. So it helps you write your brief, it helps you check your brief, it helps ensure that that brief is as it should be, and if you're a partner, I don't know who wouldn't want to check it at that point, right? And make sure it's okay. And there already was a huge amount of pressure externally, completely outside of AI, from clients that simply were not want, willing to pay for that legal research anymore. And they, were, they, weren't, they weren't willing to kind of consume that, so the law firms are trying to figure out kind of what to do about it, right? And so I thought that was sort of a really interesting intersection of an, like an exogenous trend 
as well as AI really helping people to be better at their jobs. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. And you mentioned healthcare earlier. Right. Um, you know, one of the kind of big success stories, maybe not for radiologists, but, but, but for people who are uh, getting treated has been um, the advances in AI and radiology. Right. Where else, you know, what are the next things down the list that AI could really help with? For healthcare, yeah. I mean, I definitely, I mean, Vita is an example, right? I, I mean, I, I personally believe that the fundamental problem with health in this country, and I've spent 10 years in healthcare, I've been in venture fat 10 years, and and actually was looking at healthcare from the very beginning when that was not what anyone really wanted to touch, which is always kind of like where I want to, I want to be in the contrarian realm usually. Uh, but my, my thesis here, when you really dig into the numbers and you really dig into what's happening in healthcare, is it's lose 50 pounds and go to sleep at night and take care of yourself, right? And because what happens is when, when you look at the comorbidities, they're like this, right? Everything else is sort of at the margin. And um, there's a lot of money in cancer. There's a huge amount of money there, and it's a good place, place to focus. But when you really want to impact society, and how many trillion dollars? It's like 21% like of our GDP right now. Um, you, it's really helping people take better care of themselves, and that's really on the behavioral front. And there's a ton of data, and it's fuzzy, messy, not clean data, and there's a ton of it. And so that, for me, was a really great place to look at the application of AI and machine learning. And then if you can use that now to somehow efficiently leverage like live coaches over the top of that, that's really a win. So that, that's where I focus. But there is a lot of the radiology. There's really interesting. So AI is very interesting in two fronts, you know, image, images, right? Because there's a lot of, lot of information there to digest. And voice. And we were, one of the, we were a Series A investor in Siri, so we know that place pretty well. And so radiology is a phenomenal area that you would naturally innately think, oh, they should just do this, right? And when you use a combination, it's not just AI and it's not just doctors themselves. When you use that combination together, that's where you get the, the most gain, right? That's where you get the most um, accuracy. But you have other issues there, which are how, how do you do change management? How do you get the processes? How do you get the images in an accessible format where you can even, like, you know, they're on the PAC systems and everything else. So it's an area we've looked at. There have been companies that have come out. There was one about eight years ago down in Arizona, and I think they moved to the East Coast. But it, there have been companies that have been coming out trying to kind of solve that problem. And I think it will be solved, but it's, it's a tough problem. It's not as obviously easy to fix as we might like. You said that you were interested in healthcare before a lot yes. of other people were. Why did they shy away from it then, and why have they got involved now? You know, I think you know what I was told actually was just that they're, it's largely driven by what's happening in Washington. And so when we did our first healthcare investment, I immediately, nine months later, did a conference where we brought Anish Chopra and Todd Park out to the West Coast for the first time, and we did DC to VC. And it was basically trying to educate people on, hey, the High Tech Act is really happening, Affordable Care Act has been signed, here's where the money is moving. So I approached my healthcare investments as where is the money moving, mm -hmm. right? And, and how is that working? And so, um, so a lot of the investors had been burned by past you know, legislation and past health care reform acts where they put money in and then the next, the next you know, uh, regime comes in and changes everything and we've kind of seen that, right? Yeah. And so people are fairly, and people, there's so much money sloshing around health care that there's not a lot of motivation to do what we would deem, I guess, the right thing. And so um, there's not ownership people who are actually, you know, the patient have no visibility and often in terms of the expenses. And so there's a lot of things that are just broken that don't work like we all would hope it would actually work. And so uh, my, my thesis was really you have to start with the data. So we invested in the largest cloud-based EMR. They were just getting off the ground at the time and with the idea that, okay, you need the data to actually make good decisions yeah. and, and start there. So that's where a lot of our investment in healthcare has really resided. I'm going to go to the questions a bit earlier than I did last time, make sure people <laughs> have enough time. So get them ready if you just want to put your hands up. Um, um, Hanson So is asking, are there any specific projects in the blockchain space that you're excited about? Oh, in the blockchain space. Uh, we are, I am excited about blockchain. I think you know, we've looked again, and I'm, I'm a financial services investor, so I do a lot in fintech. So there's blockchain, there's crypto, and... Um, those two things are very different. But I think digital asset management makes a ton of sense in blockchain, so we keep looking for those kinds of opportunities. Uh, the banks are using blockchain largely internally to manage sort of siloed data internally, so those things could potentially be interesting. 
We haven't found like the one thing at this point in time. We keep looking and, uh, and we keep evaluating that space. But those are sort of the two areas that I've kept a very open mind about. Um, there's some things, you know, some things in compliance and fraud and identity management and all that that I think are, are really interesting and important for everyone that could also, could also work. So Someone was telling me about a, a blockchain startup that does dating. It's like a dating app. I didn't really you exchange tokens? understand it. Yeah, it's basically <laughs> like in order to, for, to get attractive people to yeah. um, reply to your message, you give them some kind of token, which I don't think is the basis for a long-term relationship. Maybe we shouldn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> the tokenization, like she's a two and you're a one. Like, have you seen hot or not? You can just tokenize that, right? <laughs> exactly. That's hilarious. Oh dear. Yeah, we've seen some really interesting blockchain applications. <laughs> Like, how did and, you get there? <laughs> and companies, of course, that rename themselves blockchain when they have... And then there's value yeah. shoots to the roof. And yeah. you're like, what part of your infrastructure is on blockchain? And you sit and you dive through and you're like, wait, wait, this like little teeny thing over here, which is like the registry or something. It's really interesting. But there are interesting applications, I think, and we continue to look pretty aggressively at that space. And, uh, and, and I, I really think this digital rights asset management, like or copyright, I mean, that that's completely... That makes a lot of sense, and of course, crypto kitties, right? The virtual good space. So, yeah. um, so um, Mikhail Semenek, uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. People always pronounce my name wrong. Um, as an investor in Lumina, brackets, exciting startup. I know, I had the hardware question. Right? Um, <laughs> what do you see as the biggest challenges of bringing self-driving tech to market? Software, hardware, or business models? Software, hardware, or business models? Like all of the above. Like it's all hard, right? It's very hard. Uh, but the thesis on Luminar really was that you needed um, you needed the lidar system that was actually safe and accurate and, and attainable at like a, a low enough cost structure first, and then the software comes, and then you know the business model of course comes after that. And so um, that was really the thesis behind Luminar, and it comes from a lot from the legal space. So if you look at where you know autonomous is going, and, and and I invest in this partially because you look at like the number one cause of death in the U.S. for people under 35, and it's car accidents, and and, and it's it, it, it's a factor, it's a the highest death rate by a factor effect, right? And so you think, well, how can I in venture really impact society? And it might not be perfect, but it's going to be better. When I when I first started driving a Tesla, the thing that terrified me was the other drivers. As I'm looking around, I'm like, holy shit! Like that person's like, doing their makeup, they're disciplining their child, they're on the phone, and I'm like, oh my god, it's really frightening. And so that was that was a big part of it. And so I just believe that you know the the cameras work to some extent, but they work in a in a in a tort system like a legal system, right? Which is a reasonable man or woman standard, right? So if you had an accident and you acted like somebody might reasonably act in your situation, um, you're okay. But when you get into common carrier law and you get into truly autonomous, that's not good enough. And so that's where the that's really where the belief that you needed a very a fundamentally different, more robust lidar system that was cheap that could be produced at a level um, that that people could afford it on a, on an average scale would would work. And of course, then comes you get the data. And now you have to draw. You have to do the algorithms, and you've got to do the stack because it's not just lidar, right? It's radar, it's camera, it's all those things. And so, and none of it's easy. But when you look at you know what we want to tell our kids about that we helped enable, you know that would be something really amazing overall. Um, and I'm going to take this probably as the last question. But, okay. Um, <laughs> Martha Amaran says, "What is the role of voice in healthcare? What are the frictions oh, to adoption?" Oh, sorry, I just killed everyone's ears. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm a voice, the role of voice is astounding in healthcare. Um, one in 10 people in the United States cannot read. And, they, and, and, and we're not talking like they can't read the Wall Street Journal. They can't read. And, and you look at that. So a lot of people think, oh, voice is good for the elderly. I mean, who read the article here in San Francisco where the kid got out of high school and literally had failed every class, you know, his entire high school? I mean, 25% of kids in San Francisco don't graduate from high school. That's my next life, right? Um, so when you talk to people at San Francisco General and these hospitals, they're like, yeah, that's a fabulous whiz-bang app. It's not going to help us. We need pictures, right? And, we need those, and that also is where the real cost in the healthcare system comes. That, that is the population that's largely using the emergency room for their primary care. And so when you look at like the role of voice, it's actually the only vehicle that can deliver healthcare to the, probably the, the most underserved population and the most expensive population. 
And so I think the role of voice is absolutely critical in the healthcare world. Well, that's fascinating. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very fun. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so I'd like to welcome Anna Patterson, the founder and managing partner of Gradient Ventures, to the stage. Thank you, Anna. So Anna was Google's vice president of engineering in AI, integrating AI into products across Google before starting Gradient Ventures. Um, and um, and you also have a very long history with search engines, including uh, writing your piece, Why Writing Your Own Search Engine is Hard, um, which seemed pretty obvious to me, but tell me why. <laughs> um, so it, it's, a, it's a good question for MIT. I don't know if anybody actually used that in their syllabus, mm. um, but uh, various universities, in, including Stanford, they write to me. I, maybe that's a dirty word here, sorry. <laughs> um, and they um, did use the, the article, and I, I wrote it just after uh, graduate school. Um, I was doing a history-based search engine out of the Internet Archive, and oh, because cool. the archive has more pages than are live on the web, because you know, it will call Yahoo you know, 10 times a day or CNN, and so uh, it really wanted to keep track of the ephemeral history um, of, of the web. And so um, after uh, that went live, I mean, it was what, I guess 2003, um, it started getting amazing traffic for uh, a .org. Um, so it was, uh, it got about five million uh, people a day coming wow. to this search engine. And, um, and doing pretty interesting searches. And so um, I was asked to, to write uh, why writing your own search engine is, is hard. And, um, and then when I joined Google, people said, I gave away many secrets about writing a search engine. Um, but it, it's, uh, it was a typical student project where I was given a, a deadline by a journalist, <laughs> and they kept saying it's final, final. I mean, every, anyone who's done a journal article knows. They say it's final, final, final. I mean, it really, you've got to get it to me. So it was due it at midnight, and I, I started it at 10. Oh, wow. <laughs> so um, so that, that was the next thing that was hard. But it, it was great because it was like stream of consciousness, um, you know, talking about the different phases of a search engine. Uh, the different pieces and different uh, ways to attack each part of the problem. Oh, yeah. I'm, so I'm, you didn't read it. I'm going to try that now. I, mean, I don't think I can ever write my own search engine, but I think I might be able to do, do a long piece in two hours. Let's see if we can do that. Um, so, so why did you then want to make the move from being an AI practitioner to an investor, which is what you are now? Yeah. Um, so in the AI division, um, various product areas around Google would come to me and say, I'd like to um, kind of upgrade or think about ways to incorporate AI into the products. And um, still at Google, although we have a lot of engineers, there's a lot more people outside than in. So I started looking to, uh, to startups to partner with. And I would um, make all my startup meetings on, on a Thursday. And I realized um, I was looking forward to Thursday a lot. So um, that's always a sign that maybe you should change what you're doing. And so. Uh, I love talking to entrepreneurs and um, really seeing the growth of the companies. And that's why I switched and why we formed Gradient Ventures. Yeah, so Gradient Ventures is within Google. Yeah. What can you offer AI founders that other venture capitalists can't? I'll, I'll make sure they don't know. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's really um, not that they can't, but what we did, um, because all of our uh, partners do have a technical background, and we had been recent AI practitioners. We went on a listening tour. Like, what were the AI founders uh, finding difficult? And so I would say um, in, in like a small startup-y kind of talk, a lot of times they would start their talk with amazing hoops they went through to get data and uh, amazing hoops they went through to, to get people. Um, and then how they got their first model and they got their first customer and started getting traction. So um, we really saw those evolving themes and we uh, formed the fund around them so um, that we have a startup rotation program where uh, AI practitioners take leave from Google and directly help uh, startups. Um, I think it's a fallacy a bit when I hear 
people say that there's like data laying around. I think there is a lot of knowledge when you're making a model about what data you need to collect. A lot of times it isn't laying around. You actually have to know what you want to do, and then you have to figure out how to get the data to get there. And oftentimes it means re-instrumenting the very system uh, that, that you want in order to save the right data, to make the right model, to make the right inferences. And so um, we thought by uh, rotating in people who've done that path many, many times, maybe it could help accelerate the path to the first model, path to the first customer. And is it also a good way for Google to get good talent and potential acquisitions? Um, we are an ROI fund, so we're not uh, focused on um, trying to acquire these startups. I mean, obviously, we love our founders and love our companies. Otherwise, we wouldn't have invested. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean our, our group is a small venture, and we love them. It, it doesn't mean that, that Google loves them. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I, I, yeah. I understand that maybe you don't want to phrase it to them like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of your investments is Algorithmia. Yeah. And so this is a marketplace for algorithms. Yeah. How does that work? Um, so uh, it, it actually funds one of the AI labs at Berkeley. Um, people can put up their models, mm -hmm. and then they have a set of wrappers in a whole bunch of different languages so that you can just copy the wrapper uh, put it into your um, code, and, and then call the model live uh, on, on an instance in the cloud. And you can actually play around with it, because all these models are, are live, uh, if, you, if you wanted to um, look at a model that took in text and maybe predicted sentiment, and you, know, you want to play around with it, you could actually put in some sentences or put in a story and actually test the different models on maybe your own uh, data in an ad hoc way. Um, otherwise, what you wind up doing is saying, I'm sure there's nothing out there for me, and so I'll do it all again myself. Um, so I love the marketplace uh, aspect, but um, actually once you get a model up there, they actually do a lot of the DevOps for you. So they consider themselves like a DevOps for AI models um, that they uh, do improve them and learn over the system in time, uh, over time, and figure out which um, models can be co-located on a machine with other models in order to save uh, the end customer money. Oh, fantastic. And another one, we were talking earlier about you know, how sometimes it's jobs that you don't particularly want that AI is taking. Yeah. Um, and you've invested in CAPE, which is AI for drones. Um, does that eliminate any dangerous jobs? Um, I would say it did enable uh, jobs that really couldn't get done. So they have clients in the mining industry. This is one of the great things about the job. I never learned about the mining industry mm -hmm. in my previous Did you get to life. go down a mine? No, I have not gone down a mine, but I have it on good authority that mines have amazing Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> you don't get cell phone coverage down there. So uh, for safety reasons, they have amazing Wi-Fi. And so um, these drones can uh, fly uh, a route and actually kind of go over the cliff and inspect uh, certain crevices where um, it would be very hard to like build a scaffolding in order to, to go down and look. Um, and they can fly like the exact same repeated mission so that they have uh, a camera um, and, and uh, pictures over time so that they can uh, look at how, how the mine is changing over time. And so at the moment, is it just mines, or is there other things it does? Um, they do mines, and they also have um, um, interesting applications in, in firefighting, um, another thing I didn't learn about. But once the firefighter gets to your house, they actually have two minutes to make a plan, and then they have to go in, right? Because there could be uh, people or, or dogs or property damage. And so um, they're building out like a 911 service. So when you call 911, a drone can go to your house, and then that's actually streamed to the person riding shotgun in the, um, in the fire truck. And they can actually start making a plan on the way. And this uh, drone can have a lot of equipment on it to look at, um, at hotspots. Because we've all, like, I called for a um, barbecue fire. So they would have seen <laughs> outside hotspot, no inside hotspot, right? Um, That's fascinating. Yeah, and because of regulation, it's more difficult here, but it is uh, rolling out in Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Great, yeah. I mean, it's the first time I've ever Which wanted zero, to go see zero, a fire. Zero, zero, zero there. <laughs> Not 911. Zero, yeah. zero, zero. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, and um, another one is about, also kind of about safety, Scotty Labs. Yeah. Um, safety of driverless cars, what do they do? So um, Scotty was uh, founded as uh, a coach. And, and then, um, so you can imagine that your teen might need a coach while they're driving, or um, maybe you could get a subscription um, for your dad if he's aging. And, um, and so then you actually have another driver there, almost like a driver's ed person who could uh, take over or, or break or even talk to the person. Um, and then, um, as you know, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, autonomous vehicle startups in Silicon Valley, and a number of them approached them to say, hey, could you coach our AI? So instead of uh, just a planning uh, system um, with you know, all the integrated sensors, they often know that they're in a situation where they know that their algorithms are not um, performing, so they have like some probability of success in this situation, so they can um, pull over and ask Scotty to take over, or as they're moving into that situation, they can ask Scotty to kind of beam into the car remotely, really, and like start uh, paying attention to the road with the algorithm. So it's, a, so it's another sort of human AI. Yes. Um, I, and you think that that's the future as well, the, the two working I think together. it's a really nice path uh, to autonomy, um, but I also like uh, the idea of of being there. I, I have four kids, and two of them have learned to drive, and I'm still alive, but um, it was pretty harrowing, and I, I would have definitely paid for a subscription for them, and, uh, and unfortunately, my parents, my, my dad, I hope this isn't on film, I'm not sure he should be driving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd like Scott to sure be his, his coach too. <laughs> uh, um, and, um, and I'm going to open up to questions in a second as well if anyone wants to, um, to ask Anna one or thing. Um, but, but last of all, I mean, there is so, you know, everyone is so excited about AI yeah. at the moment. And you have to make sensible, sober, ROI-based decisions, how yeah. do you do it? So, I mean, I actually like, I mean, a lot of people say, you know, isn't AI hyped? And um, I do think, you know, hype is another word for excitement. And I think that the excitement is warranted and it also uh, helps focus attention in an area. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually really glad that our attention is focused in this area because I think it's an important part of our future. Um, as we look at, um, I mean, it is gonna sound really boring, but as we look at the companies, I think we feel that we can take a little bit more tech risk uh, than other places, um, but you know, you do still have to make sure that there's a good market, that there's a path, that the length of time to uh, wade through uh, wondering you know, how the technology could be used in the market is a reasonable time and that you know you think the founders are are up for this journey yeah uh -huh, that's important yeah okay so um i have um one question from here uh, any specific spe uh, i've given up so i've been on stage for an hour so sorry yeah if someone brings me a drink soon that'd be yeah here's, here's a lot of um, <laughs> <laughs> um so um any specific verticals that interest you the most wow interesting verticals um, you know, we, we have done some verticals and some horizontals, um, you know, because it's MIT and you guys are probably technologists. Um, one of the most interesting AI technologies um, that I'm, I'm interested in seeing how uh, the space of those applications evolve is in uh, generative learning. Um, so I, I think that it's just you know, whereas like machine learning and optimization um, created the first wave, I'm really interested in uh, the generative models that you might see like generating music, uh, generating uh, text, but generative models in general are, instead of having data, basically they generate a data set that's kind of indistinguishable from the, da the data that you collected. 
and um, I think it's a, it's a really exciting area. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Okay, is there anyone in the room that wants to ask a question? Oh, Mary. Mm. Hi, Could Mary be Lee. anything now. Hello. Hi, Anna. Um, <laughs> I have a question for Anna. Um, you and your team have such extreme technical expertise for a VC. I'm wondering where is that an advantage and where is that a disadvantage? Because it's so yeah. rare and so it's probably incredibly attractive to everyone in this room, I'm just guessing. Um, so I think it's an advantage when sometimes um, we've seen founders that are extraordinarily technical, love to uh, talk um, on a whiteboard, um, love to show us their journal papers, and and their customers are very technical as well. So they are making customer um, traction. So we have one that's like very mathy. Um, and so I think we were able to understand the math and, uh, and then understand the possibilities of his platform. And then the people on the other side who are buying are super technical as well. And, um, and you know, um, so I think we just really bonded. Um, so it was good. Disadvantage, I think that um, we're a new fund, so it's, it's unproven, so we don't know uh, yet some of the things that we don't know. Um, we are pretty careful about uh, looking at, at market. I think uh, there, are, there are some um, places where the tech is easier, but the market is definitely there, because hey, if the market's not there, maybe bad idea for company. And then um, there's room for something that's uh, more challenging. You're not sure that you're going to get the tech to work. But if it did, the market would be there. And I think those are the kind of things um, where, where we're focusing. Well, that's a good question, I thought. Um, anyone else in the room? We are kind of overrunning anyway, but just in case. All right. All right. Thank you. OK, well, thank you so much. I think we have to do a photo. Oh, picture, okay. yes. <laughs> So Anne Murako is the co-founding partner of Floodgate. Uh, Forbes called you the most powerful woman in startups, but I'm not sure how they measured that. I'm not sure either. <laughs> uh, Lots of measures. Very, very powerful. Um, I think you should embrace it. Like, you know, we've got the puppets behind the scenes. <laughs> um, you're also a lecturer in entrepreneurship at Stanford and a Palo Alto native. Some of your investments include Lyft and TaskRabbit. Um, and, and you started Floodgate 10 years ago. So how has AI evolved over all that time? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so back in 2008, when I was first getting started, um, AI, and I was actually in the midst of a PhD program also as I was, as I was getting started with Floodgate. Um, what was interesting was it was sort of this period where big data was becoming the big term. Um, and it wasn't so much ARML, neural nets, those were things that I was studying sort of in academia. They weren't as applied in, in the real world. And, and we were starting to think about whether or not big data was going to actually be a big problem. And um, I thought it was interesting because back then it was, it was fairly uh, more of a scientific thing. Um, and a lot of the, the questions we were trying to answer were more on the database side, and, um, and the real applications in market were still a big question mark. Um, and most of the time when I would talk to people about applications in AI or machine learning or data, the question was always, well, how big is the data set? And it was interesting to me because I was dealing in my research not with really large data sets, but very complex data sets. Mm. And I kept on trying to explain to people it's not about the size of the data, and it doesn't matter if it's petabytes of data, you can have actually a very small data set. If it's sparse or if it has really weird characteristics, you can find that it's very difficult to parse out. And so, so I love the evolution now that we're at a point where we're talking about now what do you do with this data set? And we've we found that you know, companies like Google or Facebook themselves have transformed even the way 
the individual worker works, right? The, the number of people at a Facebook or Google who touch data and use it within their daily workflow is fundamentally different from most Fortune 500 companies. And we believe that that's sort of where the future lies. And if you believe that, then the enterprise software will have to change to support that because not everyone is a data scientist. And that's where I think the opportunities lie. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, it's interesting you mentioned you know, Google and Facebook, especially Facebook has been very much sort of in the spotlight at the moment for what it does with data and, and privacy. I mean, is there any part of you that worries that these kind of generalized concerns will end up holding some of the more interesting applications of AI back? Yeah, and I, I think, sir, there's, there's fundamental concerns about data privacy. And this goes back to this notion of centralization versus decentralization of data. And I think we're, we're always going to have whiplash as to which one we want, right? On one hand, centralization of data implies one very powerful organization that actually controls that data set and knows so much about you, and now suddenly you feel vulnerable. But then you talk about decentralization, and now some absurd picture of you is online, and you want it taken down, and who do you go to, right? Mm -hmm. That's a completely different kind of lack of control and privacy concern that also exists. And so I think we're going we're gonna to have to figure out how to do better control of your own personalized data um, at the personal level. And that's not something that we've been able to do. And in one area that I'm particularly interested in is, uh, and this goes sort of to the, the concept of blockchain that was asked before, um, there's this pull, this weird tension between artificial intelligence machine learning, which is really around centralized training of data, and this pull towards now decentralized applications with blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, and in that world, there isn't as much centralized data. So how do you actually do intelligence in that kind of environment? And I think more and more we're going to have to figure out how not to centralize data, but then create intelligent solutions. And that's a very hard technical problem. That's an area that I'm really fascinated by today. And is anyone or any companies working on that? We keep talking about it. I haven't seen as many in that, it, the, the specific solutions around how do you manage that kind of data and then how do you do training in that kind of environment? I haven't seen. Mm, if any of you have the answer, I want to talk to you. <laughs> um, and um, the new privacy rules in Europe, the general GDPR. Yeah, my favorite four letter word. Um, <laughs> they, I mean, there are special provisions for what people can do and not do with mm. data. Is this going to significantly restrict the development of some AI technology? Um, you know, I've actually seen it as uh, an impetus for, for new technology. So I'm actually seeing a lot of companies come to us and say, look, we've been thinking about GDPR, and I think we have a solution for that. Um, and so if anything, these, these kind of legal restrictions can be a real big pain. Um, but I think it forces a question of how do you now do it, because actually the government asked people to do it before there was actually a reasonable solution, mm. um, that, that causes people to ask the real technical question. So I think, you know, I've been, I've been interested because when, when we talk to companies and they're coming back to us with potential solutions, it's sort of an interesting um, area to look at. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating. And in fact, I guess as we talk about other areas of regulation in tech, there's a lot of like, but that's not possible. Maybe it will actually spur people to find right. out what's possible. Um, and you had your PhD from Stanford in math modeling of computer security. So do you think that there are great opportunities for AI and cybersecurity? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started my PhD in 2003. And I was really interested in how mathematical modeling would be applied in, in security because I was starting to see data that was being generated um, where you might be able to actually create interesting models on top of that. And it was interesting because when I first started my PhD, I, I went and talked to a bunch of folks about it. And uh, I was lucky I had funding for my research. But I actually had some people tell me, well, security um, security is a binary problem. And if you have a security problem, you have a technology issue. It's not a risk issue. Um, and I remember being kind of aghast <laughs> by it. Um, 
But that was sort of the, the majority view, right? You just needed to find the right technology to plug that hole, and then you had solved the technology problem. And they told me, you know, I had people say, it's not an interesting area of research. Um, it was also interesting because it, that, in that era, it was still very much, you know, I would have called it the era of vandalism. You had like these kids who were sort of vandalizing sites, and that was about as bad as it got. And then you moved to this state where actually there were clearly monetary um, problems that occurred as a result of security incidents. And now you had companies actually worried about the dollars and cents of security issues. And then you moved into a world later on in my PhD where actually nation states were getting involved in security incidents. And then all through this period, you look at the solutions and what, what people were using to actually protect against all of these attacks, they fundamentally didn't really change that much. If you flip under the hood, it was sort of, you know, we were trying to protect at the perimeters, and now they're saying defense in depth, but like the actual technology and thought process that was being used, it was still in the era of vandalism. And yet, we're talking about nation state warfare. And so, so the, the idea that we need to now leverage all of this data, use intelligence, and really start to actively pursue and figure out like the game theory around what happens, I think that's really, really critical. Because there is modeling that you can do around the adversary. There's modeling that you could do about your environment. And there's intelligence that you can then apply against all of this. Um, and still there's a lot of richness that can be applied in these areas. We've seen behavioral modeling. Some of that does not work. I think the version 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 of those eras, I think that's where we'll, we'll see really interesting solutions. But I suppose it also depends, you know, what the adversary does with AI as well. Yeah, and so this is where, um, you know, so my background is also in statistics, and so, you know, it, Part of the idea of statistics is you have to randomize, especially if you have an adversary. Because if you have a predictable solution, then an adversary can actually predict what you're going to do. And so therefore, it's not really a solution. And so in this kind of adversarial uh, situation, you actually have to have you know, probabilistic solutions, which goes to sort of the, the areas that I'm most interested in when it comes to intelligence, um, is that you know, today, when you think about enterprise software, enterprise software is really a dumb form. It's like you put in data, and then it sort of spits it out in pretty graphs. Maybe it automates some things in the future, but it's not a statistical model that underpins everything. And the, the data itself isn't statistical, right? And so therefore, the outputs don't have a statistical property either. And, and so, my belief is that the evolution, what intelligence does to enterprise software is that we used to have this model, you have data, you have business logic, and then a presentation layer. Now the business logic is actually a model and it evolves over time. That actually changes the way you treat the data as well. The data has to have statistical properties. It's not just you know, finite or, or known properties. And so from that, you actually get really interesting models. You can evolve those models over time. And then that means that the presentation layer has to be fundamentally different. This is why you can't just take existing enterprise software and make it smarter. That just doesn't work. You can't take Workday and hire a 1,000 data scientists and now suddenly you have Smart Workday. And so that's the real opportunity where we have an opportunity in a completely different way of generating enterprise software in the next generation. That means all of these companies out there that have you know, $100 billion in market cap, they're all in danger because the fundamental infrastructure will change. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, one of the themes of today has been how humans and AI can work together. And I was really intrigued by your company, Loras.ai, mm -hmm. uh, which promises to use AI to help companies bring empathy to hard conversations. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm British, so we just don't have hard conversations. I'm we Japanese, just ignore it. we don't either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but tell me about this, because it uses research, it, it uses crisis line data? Yeah, so uh, Crisis Tax Line is a really interesting nonprofit company, so they have um, a data corpus of over 60 million text messages that have gone from 
uh, people in crisis, and over 10,000 volunteers who have been trained to deal with people who are text messaging someone around crisis. And what's really interesting about their corpus of data is that they, it, it changes over time. So it's not like you can just train on this data set once and know how to respond to people. Because if there's a weather pattern, that actually changes the way people interact. Or if there's you know, a particular incident that happens, uh, that actually changes the kind of crisis that someone might have and the trigger words that people will feel. And so you're constantly having to learn and in the crisis text line, they have to prioritize the text messages that are coming in. Um, and, and the founder, Nancy Lublin, was starting to get um, requests from enterprises. How do we use the kind of training that you've brought to your volunteers to actually our, our enterprises, our employees? And she thought that was just a really interesting idea she hadn't really thought of. And so Loris is now, uh, partnered with Crisis Text Line to leverage that corpus of data, and then we will work with enterprises to leverage their corpus of data, and then start to think about how do you then create the, that kind of training for their audience set. So you could imagine it would be used in the setting of a customer support line, right? So if you are a customer of Comcast, you may actually be in crisis quite often. And <laughs> when you call, you have a certain level of anxiety about poten potentially the service that you've received. And so that conversation can be quite a hard conversation for customer support. You can imagine the same thing of, now I need to go talk to my boss about getting a raise. What is that conversation like? How am I most effective in having that type of conversation? Those things we believe we can help improve and if you think about it, conversations are actually the lifeline of everything. It's how you, how you actually become better at your job. It's how you actually operate within your job. It's how you define your job. It's how you define products. It's how you execute. So, so if you can't make conversations more effective, you can't actually become a better employee. You can't become a better company. But then when you take a step back, how often have you ever been coached? Or how, where have you ever learned how to have a conversation? You never do. It's just instinctive, right? And so, so but there's data around that. There is actual, there's even, you know, PhDs on this very topic, and yet it's not exposed to a generalized audience. And unlike sort of a one-shot training thing, it's actually muscle. You actually need to exercise on a regular basis. You need to be reminded, and you can constantly improve. And that's the basis of Loris. Oh, it sounds fascinating. I definitely feel like there's some conversations in my life I could do with training on. Um, OK, I'll open it up to any questions from the floor. There's one way back there if someone wants to run over. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this actually isn't my question, but the CEO of Loris AI was just recently interviewed on Marketplace by Kai Rizdal and Molly Wood about the same topic with uh, Crisis Text Line. Um, and the interesting question that came out of that was, like, what are your thoughts on the ethics of using data that was shared privately through a Crisis Text Line for essentially a private venture? Right, so a lot of what we're learning is not within the actual conversation. It is rather what are the words that are most important and how do you match it. So it's not content as much as, as an example, you know, what is, when, when you feel, a um, good example is when you're talking to someone who is having a problem, um, what are good words to use in that situation? Is it a why question, a how question, or a what question? And you can actually trace what types of conversations actually lead to a better outcome versus not. And so it's not about what is actually within that conversation versus the trace of how those conversations evolve. The second thing is actually 
Um, it's more the outcome, the learnings that we're using then into the corporate setting. The corporate setting actually needs to be trained on its own set of data, right? Like the crisis text line data is interesting. Some of the models will be interesting, but it's not actually going to help in the Comcast uh, customer support data. And so the, learn, the models and the training that we will do will be in that specific environment. Fantastic. Um, one last question. Anyone before we go out and get a drink? Um, um, all right. I'll have one last question. Okay. Um, so, you know, there are all these, as you talked about, really fantastically interesting and caring uses of AI. But there's um, also a lot of concern about the biases that we can imbue in AI, depending on the data set or the people that are engineering it. I mean, how do you think you compensate for that? I, you know, I, I think so. First of all, you compensate by making sure that the data inherently doesn't have these biases, and there's ways in which you can actually really start to, to understand that. Um, and so, I think first and foremost, it's around being careful around data sets. The second is, I actually think, in many ways, if you are, if you're using, as an example, unsupervised learning, you actually have the possibility of of freeing ourselves from a lot of the the biases that we naturally have. Uh, recently, my, my nine-year-old was coming back to me explaining to me the scientific method. And um, I was struck by how much the scientific method is a relic of this past, of how we operated when data itself was the limiting factor, and how much the scientific method itself is a way of introducing bias into your knowledge set, right? And when I was doing my PhD, my, my, um, my advisor really loved dynamic programming. And so in a lot of different situations, wanted to apply dynamic programming. But there would be situations where that wasn't, that wasn't the set of models that we ought to be learn using. And, and you think about how research gets done, you, you, you are a, a product of the lineage of um, information that you've been taught or, or the way your teachers have been taught. And so if we are able to then not think about hypotheses first and then go and find data, but rather have the data then start to tell us where we ought to look, um, and then also really explore what the data where the data has biases, then, then I think we start to think about the questions in the right way. And so, so I think there's a combination of, you need to actually be very critical of how data is now accumulated, because if we're going to train models and um, uh, algorithms based on it, you better, you better believe that it's not going to have um, really bad biases. Like one of the jokes is, you know, uh, what would a uh, machine learning algorithm decide if everyone was running and jumping off a bridge? It would decide that that was the best course of action, right? <laughs> um, and you don't want to have that. You have to actually, this is where I think humans will always be involved, you want to actually take a step back and see if what is happening within the best solution, the optimization, is actually truly the, the best situation. Are you really optimizing for the right things? Well, thank you very much, Anne. I like to end on an AI joke, so that went well. Don't jump off a bridge. <laughs>